Welcome, everyone. Good to see you here. We've, uh, we both come from Europe, so we're both jet lagged. So yeah. excuse us it's, if we. It's better today, but. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's worse today for me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Justin Cormack, I'm the CTO at Docker. Yeah, so I'm Angel, I'm part of the um, Wasan team at VMware AI Labs. So you already went. We this. already, we've already <laughs> introduced ourselves, yes. So, yeah, I think I can start with this one. So, one of the things that I usually like to say is that containers change the way we develop, distribute, and deploy applications. So, I remember when I joined my first company that the first step that I had to do was to install everything in my laptop. So, I had to download the language runtimes for the application, download the MySQL database, install all the data that I wanted to use to start actually coding for the project that I was uh, working for. The thing is that, as you may imagine, everyone has their own version of the environments. We have differences on the, on the runtime's version, different data, different databases. So it turned out that it was a complex environment because this is where I really learned the phrase, it works on my machine, basically. So everyone was having different things. We were finding some issues. And it was a complex thing to manage. And everyone that joined the company had to go through the same process. Um, it was difficult also to keep everything up to date. And if you mix the production environment into this equation, this can be really, really difficult. So it was um, until the point in which we started learning more about containers when we started changing things. So instead of having to download and install all the things in your, or all the tools in your laptop, you can just download the Docker Compose file, you can start building your application, and you can start coding in just a few hours instead of after one day. So setting this, uh, this context, I read about this specific tweet from Solomon Hikes, which is one of the Docker co-founders. I think some of you are familiar with this. Um, I think you are very familiar I, with this. I, 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 was sitting, I was sitting next to Solomon when he wrote this tweet. We were actually, um, it was actually just when WASI came out and we were experimenting with incorporating WASM into Docker build and working out what multi-arch looked like for WASM and the, some of the things that, that we're actually going to talk about later on today. We were experimenting with early versions of that because it was kind of exciting, but it was also back then kind of difficult as well. But I think the, the kind of, the sort of aha moment that Solomon had at the time was really about, these things are very similar in a lot of ways. It's about packaging a set of code together into one thing that you can run that's repeatable, um, it's portable, it runs anywhere, um, and you know that kind of it, you know repeatability. You're talking about it runs on my laptop, it runs in production, very much the same. There's a security boundary around WASM that's very similar to the one around container. I mean, it's, architecturally, it's very different, but it gives that security isolation in the same way. So there's a lot of similarities, and so that's kind of where that you know that kind of um, thinking about, um, you know, they, they fulfill a lot of the same roles and they fulfill a lot of the same purposes and they're kind of interchangeable in that way. And that's really what we're going to carry on, you know, you know mm -hmm. this has kind of carried us through in terms of talking about, you know, having these, having these, mm -hmm. doing WASM with Docker today yeah. and, and that interchangeability. Yeah, um, and then at that time, I wasn't aware of the WebAssembly ecosystem at all. It was something, as, as you were mentioning, it was something new and fresh. So that was, I was excited. And um, if containers change the way I develop and um, um, deploy applications, what's WASM and how can it help me to continue improving um, and actually running the applications together? So here we have two new concepts, at least at that time, which was WebAssembly and WASI. Um, we're going to do just a very brief introduction about these concepts. I think we're in Wasancom. I think you all are pretty familiar with WebAssembly, but just let's use And the people on the recording might not be so familiar. So. That's true. So yeah, it's, it's good that we have a little bit of introduction here. So basically, WebAssembly is an open standard that defines a binary instruction format. Um, it means that you can take code like in C, C++, Rust, and instead of targeting an operating, a specific operating system and architecture, you are targeting WebAssembly. These models, which contains all the source code of the application you are building, can run on top of a WebAssembly runtime or virtual machine, depends how you call it. But 
still thinking about the similarities that, that um, Justin was talking about uh, containers, you still have one missing piece, which is, okay, we have a contain, uh, sorry, we have a WebAssembly module running in a runtime, but it's fully isolated. How can I reach the same resources that you can, do, you can reach with a container? And this is basically about WASI. So WASI is the other portion of that, of that tweet. So it's a standard to access system resources or, or access um, system resources on the server level. So it provides low level APIs for accessing things like file system, sockets, and environment variables. Because with a container, those were provided by the Linux kernel APIs, exactly. which was kind of, you know, that was the system API, what was basically the Linux kernel API for containers, which is how, how they got that portability. Exactly, you have that available by default because the way that containers work. But in WebAssembly, you don't have that information by default because the models are fully isolated. So you have all those resources, and the way you access them is using WASI, which is a set of APIs that allows your WebAssembly model to, for example, read a file in the system, access sockets and environment variables. So now that we have both things, the good thing is that thinking about containers and WebAssembly, they are not mutually exclusive technologies. You can use both to get all the benefits together, and this is why we are here today, to show you how to do it. So yeah, so let's, okay. let's talk about WebAssembly and containers. So both of them are really you know, a sandbox to run portable applications, just the portability kind of is, is a little bit different, and the sandbox is a little bit different. Hmm. Um, you know, as we talked about the, with containers, the, the output, the IO layer is the, is the kernel interface with WebAssembly, it has to be specifically defined and is more structured. The sandbox is um, Linux namespace isolation versus the sandbox being the, um, you know, the kind of the browser model of runtime isolation and, and lack of any way to get outside without a controlled interface. Um, WebAssembly at the moment, you know, is a, is a single binary, but we're moving into a component model where you can actually connect these together and have multiple, multiple components making up a, an application. With containers, you know, you have an image. Um, historically, part of the uniformity of containers was for, for many years, there was really a, it was a, a Linux AMD 64 you know, kind of uniform ecosystem. So there wasn't really a portability question. We, that's changed in the last few years. I mean, we, we've had Windows yep. containers for a while, but you know, ARM64 is a, is a real platform with a real market share now, and portability is much more of an issue. And now, and so with containers, you have to basically compile multiple images and bundle them together so you can run on different architectures. WebAssembly is portable by design, coming out of its browser heritage, mm -hmm. where browsers were always portable, and, and so, uh, and the WebAssembly, you know, virtual machine is designed f f to be, you know, jet compiled and so on, so it's already portable. Um, obviously, from the ecosystem point of view, they're very different. Containers have been around for a long time. There's a huge ecosystem, and they're, because they're just Linux applications, and all like they, you can use existing applications kind of unmodified because there's already applications for Linux, whereas, WebAssembly with WASI, you have to work out how to compile the, the interfaces into, into the WASI piece, and there's been a lot of work, but there's, you know, there, there's, there's, there's an impedance mismatch between existing applications, so there's, there's work, there's lots and lots of ongoing work, as I'm sure you've been hearing about today, about how that works and how that can be made better. Yeah, and actually one of the things that I found quite interesting is that as you mentioned, like at the beginning, Linux AMD 64 seems to suit all the use cases that people had at that time. But over the time, new devices come up, new architectures. You GPUs. Know, exactly. So for example, um, I remember that for me, Linux AMD 64 was super good for almost everything. But then I wanted to have my own personal server at home, and I use a Raspberry Pi. But now that's not enough. Now I need to find images that include the ERM version that I want to run for that. So it was not easy to, to make that, that portability. But you still have all, those, all that well-established ecosystem with all the applications. So you can basically just install Docker or any container runtime, and then you get access directly to a lot of applications that you can run. So, you know, 
we've, we've had this kind of history with Docker of, of working with WASM, being excited by WASM, and um, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was make an incremental path for existing Docker users and existing people, you know, to have a path to WASM that just is kind of feels natural and incremental to them, um, and that they can gradually move, you know, parts of applications or some some piece of their application where it's appropriate, where it works well into WASM, and you know, basically you kind of mix and match these technologies as they as they need, so they can they can learn, they can experiment, and they can work out which things are effective and working, and work out like you know, as the ecosystem evolves, we can evolve with them and help them do this. So that was our our aim in trying to ship WASM stuff with Docker, you know, kind of early, as well as the fact that we felt that the models. In many ways, even though there's lots of differences in many conceptual ways, they're, they're very similar. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and we are going to demonstrate that that with Docker, um, um, you can actually integrate those together using the same experience that you are used to do with uh, with containers. So here, I have a demo. Okay, it looks okay. It looks good. I don't know why I have a key. I don't know why I have a key there, but I think it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, so the first thing that we are going to do is to check. Um, how, how you can actually create your first container uh, with WebAssembly. So for that, I'm going to take a very basic Rust application, which if we see the source code, is just a hello world. So we are going to, to compile this, we are going to build the container, and we are going to run it with, with Docker. So in this specific case, the only thing that you need to do is to compile it to, to WebAssembly. In this case, I, I'm using WASM32, the WASI. So I get all those access to the resources. In this case, they are not required at all, but it's good that, that we have, well, I mean, in this case, yeah, we are using the, the, STD, the STDIO for, for showing the, the print statement. So we actually need it. So after this compilation, we have already our Rust model there, so we can start using it directly. If we use it using a WebAssembly runtime like Wasm Time or Wasm Edge, we can run it directly. But let's see how we can do it with Docker. So for the Docker file, it's pretty similar about what you are used to do with, uh, with Docker. You have a front. In this case, you don't need any base operating system because as a, web, as a WebAssembly container, you don't have the operating system layer. You can just start from scratch. The only thing that you need to do is actually copy the model that you want to put there and use it as an entry point. This is something actually that changed lately, so you need to give it like the full path instead of a relative path. Having this. You only need to build it using build X. I'm setting up the platform to Wasm, and then I'm giving it a name. Compiles, and we get the image. So now, the same way that you are running containers with Docker RAM, you can do it with, uh, with Wasm containers. The only change that you need to apply is that you need to use the runtime that you want to use in this case, which is Wasm time. There are other runtimes that you can use, like Wasm Edge and different ones. And then the platform that you want to use just to target the right container that you just created. And the name. And it works. So you have already your first uh, container base based on Rust um, and WebAssembly. But that's not all. And one thing that I found quite interesting is that there are already things that you can run using WebAssembly containers and you can put together. So let's compare, for example, how you run a Python script using a WebAssembly container and a default um, container. So here we have a simple script, pretty similar to the Rust project. I'm, I wasn't very creative that day. So you, we are just printing the hello from, and then we are putting here the platform, just to see the differences between containers um, um, and WebAssembly. So I'm going to run this first using the the Python uh, 3.11 Alpine uh, image. So yeah, I invoke Python. I pass my my um, my script after mounting it using the dash v option. And yeah, I got it as, as expected. Hello from Linux. And the same thing we can do it using WebAssembly because the same way that you publish containers into the into the Docker Hub or any other registry that you have registries using regular containers, you can manage WebAssembly as a different platform. And in this case, we from uh, from VMware um, A Labs we publish 
different um, interpreted languages like Python, Ruby, and PHP ready to use as WebAssembly containers. So here I'm using exactly the same uh, version of the, of the um, container that I ran before. In this case, I don't pass the, the binary because we are running it directly and I just pass the argument with the, with the script that I want to run. And it also works. You're using almost the same exact experience. You just need to set the right uh, runtime to use, and then you can run it. Um, it's, it's easy, the same way that you are doing before. But there is still one thing that I want to show you that I found fascinating about WebAssembly. And is that if we do Docker images, GERP, this is not going to work. So <laughs> let's do Docker images. If we check the two containers that we just ran, there is a big difference. So on the Python, even though we are using the Alpine version, it's 86 megabytes, while using the Python Wasm version, you get it to 28. And this is what we are going to talk later on about, more about this. So, so the so thing yeah. is how it works, actually. Yes. So um, in order to kind of understand how it works, it kind of helps to understand a little bit about how um, how the, the Docker ecosystem is structured. Um, so originally Docker was just this, it, back in the early days, Docker was just this monolithic engine that just ran stuff. But over, over the years, particularly um, as we've split things into CNCF projects that are multifunctional, um, Docker's been split into layers. So there's, um, there's uh, the containerd layer in the middle, which was designed around a joint project with Google to run both in Docker and in Kubernetes originally, that was the, that was the aim. And then underneath, there's the actual runtimes. And so what we've what we've done with Wasm is we've kept some of those layers, and then we've inserted inserted adapters to run Wasm in the in the places kind of in this hierarchy. So and so um, underneath Containerd, there's a there's a Shim API, which is. Um, Actually, it was a kind of interesting one because it was not originally designed as a sort yep. of public API, but it was really a convenient API to mm. use to interpose other things into how things run. So it became actually a really popular extension point. And so that's where the WASM shim or the container D shim for, for con normal containers sits. Mm. That runs, um, you know, either run C normally to run Docker containers, or you can stick all the um, all the different WASM runtimes, each each plug into that layer, but from the, you know, kind of abstracted by the container D WASM shim project that, that understands them. So there's a there's a there's a kind of exact kind of matched structure. There are some um, things that will change over time. For example, at the moment, um, Contentity is, you know, essentially a Linux project, but there's no. It almost works on other operating systems. It almost works on Mac. I spent a bunch of time pausing it, so we can do things like actually run all this stuff natively on um, on any hex because Wasm's portable in the way that the the run C and this stuff requires Linux because it's a Linux container runtime. So there's there's lots of opportunities where you can modify this architecture and do new things with it because Wasm's different, but it gives you that same pluggability. And later on, we'll talk about how you can do exactly the same thing in Kubernetes, for yep. example. Exactly. And in terms of the images, um, you know, Wasm is smaller. That's one of the things that you know people have talked about as one of the advantages for a long time. Um, a lot of it is because, um, you know, we, as we talked about with Wasm, you can do from scratch because it doesn't have all, and all the pieces, the operating system pieces. You can run containers from scratch, but a lot of them are not designed and don't work with that because they require system components. And I think that, um, you know, when you're in an operating system environment, you tend to make assumptions about what you can use and your applications tend to, oh, we'll just shell out to do this and things like that. There are disadvantages in doing that and lots of ecosystems have kind of um, tried to reduce the number of times you have to do that. And, uh, like, I think Python is one of the more closely tied to the to kind of the Linux environment, whereas the um, JVM languages tend to use more native code that um, so there's probably less difference between the sort of WebAssembly version of a Java app than there is with a with a Linux version. But um, 
you know, these, you know, these, these differences are kind of real, and, and part of the thing is also you're forced, if you use WebAssembly, not to shell out because there isn't a shell running. So you've got yep. to actually, you know, make sure your application doesn't have, use these features. Yep. So, so there's work on you as a user. Um, to, to kind of fit with uh, how the environment works. So, so there's, you know, again, it's part of the, um, it's part of the work you have to do to port your application, but you also end up with a, a much more tightly defined application that you know more, you know, it's, it's got a clearer security boundary. It's not, um, you know, so, so there's lots of, there's pros and cons either yeah. way. Yeah, and the good thing that but we were talking before, you can use both in the cases yeah, that yeah. makes more sense for you. So that's, that's, a good, uh, that's a good point. So but one of the things that, uh, that we would like to also get a bit into more into details is how the shims work, actually. Because when we talk about shims, we are talking about a compatibility layer between what container they invoke and send all the commands, everything that you need to do to spawn the, the application, the workload that you want to run, and then it goes directly to the uh, WebAssembly runtime that you want to choose. For now, we have Wasn Edge, Wasn Time, but there are more runtimes around that you can actually implement. So if we think about those, there are many different things that all the runtimes have to implement. So for example, they need to subscribe to the container day lifecycle, spawn processes, stop them, interact with OCR resources, manage CDIO. Everything needs to be done in Wasn Edge, in Wasm time and in any other uh, runtime that, uh, that wants to be integrated with this. So why not to create something common? And this is the Runguasi project. So the Runguasi project is a library that allows you to create this kind of shims and extract you to, from many of the different common functionalities that you need to implement on those. So basically, Rangwasi sets between ContainerD and your application framework, I will talk a little bit more about that, and the runtime that works underneath, like Wasn Edge, Wasn Time. So currently, what we showed was um, WebAssembly runtimes directly, like modules that can run inside those runtimes are basically web, pure WebAssembly modules. You don't have any extra feature on top of that. But there are application frameworks that give you more features like adding things like key value stores, routing stuff, and, and things like that. So those frameworks are also available in container as shims. So those one, the, the ones that I think we have now are Spider Lining from Microsoft, Spin from Fermion. They have a workshop this morning and different talks. And we have Wasm Worker Server from, from VMware. So as you mentioned, like it, was, it wasn't designed for that, but it was pretty cool how you can extend the container the capabilities using this, um, this shims um, API and also run Wasi to quickly create these shims together. So here you have also the, the, the different repositories that you can check for this. Um, coming back to the, to, the, uh, to the architecture that we had uh, before, we see that we have the Docker engine, but, but as, as you were mentioning before, is this something that it's just for Docker, or this is something that we can actually uh, reproduce in other, in other environments? And one good example is Kubernetes, since the Kubernetes environment heavily relies on containers, but is that something that we can actually change? Why not getting the same benefits that we are doing with Docker, containers, and WebAssembly, also in Kubernetes? And the good thing is that we are already on the work done because if we, if we run a cluster that based on container D for running the workers, uh, sorry, for running the workloads, you can run also the, the different shims, like the WebAssembly close to the container uh, shims. So what is required actually to, to get this work together? So the same, the same approach that you are following for, for containers in your laptop using Docker, you can reproduce that in Kubernetes. So you only need those shims together with the shims that you already have for running containers, and then you are able to run uh, WebAssembly models on top of that. But in this specific environment, it's not that easy, because as we see here, this is a pretty small cluster. We only have three nodes. And if you have to install all this manually, it may get a little bit complex. And you need to keep everything up to date, so it's not an easy task for, for administrators. So, one of the projects that simplifies this is KWASM. So KWASM is a Kubernetes operator that 
load and download all the WebAssembly uh, runtimes, um, install them directly in the different Kubernetes nodes, allowing you to start running it just by adding this help repository, installing the operator, and then you annotate the nodes. So all the nodes that you annotate with this, KWASM will automatically download all the shims and we configure container D for you. So after running these three commands, you can start creating pods that relies on WebAssembly models and start getting the advantage of both worlds in your Kubernetes clusters. So yeah, so uh, we want to really explain to you that like WASM and Kubernetes Wasm and containers are technologies that work together. They have a share a lot of similarities. From a developer point of view, they can be very, very similar. You can incrementally move applications without having to kind of totally rewrite the world. Um, with Docker, we really wanted to support this incremental way so that you can just, you know, anyone can come along, learn about Wasm, start using Wasm. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to like, if, you, if you're a, if you're, you know, if you want to help people use WASM, it's a, it's a good starting point for them. It's a, they have the similarities with um, the existing ecosystem, and as you can see, the tooling has similarities with the existing ecosystem as well. It's, we're not rewriting the world to do yep. this. We're just incrementally swapping out the bits where we made the ecosystem pluggable, and that's why it also works uh, in exactly the same way with Kubernetes, because that's part of that same ecosystem and standards. We're using the, you know, the the same registries, the same ACI formats, the same container D, and the same shims. And so it's a very, you know, it's a very incremental approach to introducing WASM into people's, into people's lives so they can kind of explore how it works, understand, you know, what the, you know, how they actually go through the process of building WASM applications, how it actually works. Um, and so it really is a kind of bridge on, into the WASM world for, for people who are, you know, used to building things with containers and, you know, particularly people who come from the cloud native world or, um, you know, using, using containers in their day-to-day -day development. It's a very incremental approach. And we think that incrementalism is, is really important. I think there was a kind of view with some people that WASM was like, like a, a whole new thing. We're going to throw everything away. But, um, you know, I think we've learned a lot of things with containers that are valuable about how to deploy applications, you know, immutable applications repeatably deployed at scale is a really important pattern. Uh, there's lots of tools around containers for um, security and signing and, uh, you know, all, um, managing registries and there's a whole sort of long, large scale infrastructure with Kubernetes that's everywhere in the world easily available. Um, and so you don't have to completely change the world, throw things away. To, to work with WASM, I mean, you can you can do it in a more incremental way. Yeah, and there will be things that won't change actually, because for example, even though we are showing um, like basic examples, like the Rust example or the Python script, if you are creating applications that are more complete, you will need things like a database. You will need things as a key value store that has persistence. So those applications are actually already implemented and you want to reuse them. You don't want to implement those in WebAssembly directly. So. You can use the tools like Docker Compose, for example. You can use the same one. You can put your services, you can set up a MySQL database, and then you can, you can set up a WebAssembly module that runs queries against that specific database. So that's the good thing, that combining both, you get all the different worlds together, and you can um, run more complex applications and more interesting things. You can explore, you can try, you can experiment, and you can run, actually, because in the end, if we have the same um, this in architecture in environments like Kubernetes, it means that you can actually put that in production and start serving a specific requests and providing value to, to your users. Yeah, I mean, I remember, again, back, back when we were, in 2019, when we were first experimenting, it was, very, it was very daunting because you kind of felt you had to do everything in WebAssembly back then, and it was mm -hmm. like, it was yep. gonna be hard, but you would spend all your time trying to fix problems with, building things and making things work and it was like really really difficult and it felt like you know they it felt like there was a really big journey to get mm. anything done whereas now you can find you can find bits that work um and build on those and, and build out more over time yep so yeah we have here 
can summary with all the links for the different projects that we were mentioning. So the good thing is that you can start using today. You can go to desktop, watch some documentation, to start getting into Docker, you can download the, the different things. You have examples there to create applications and run the containers. You have also the run Wasi um, container the was and Shins projects, which have more information about how they are built and they are pretty active in the community, in the CNCF community. We have conversations now around OCI artifacts, how they should manage WebAssembly workloads there, how you are going to actually create WASM containers and what are the shape, the different features that all the different runtimes should follow. So those kind of conversations are happening. And I recommend you that if you like this ecosystem and you are interested in that, you join those channels and start following the conversations. And we're, and we're keeping things up to date. We've, we've added a lot of different gems support, yep. for example, so you can try you know, everything, you know, try spin, try other things. So you can try and exp exp play around with the different parts of the ecosystem to learn about how they work really simply as well. And, yep. and we, we're carrying on you know, growing with, with the ecosystem and working out, you know, so if you've got things that you want to see supported, if you've got ideas, we're really open to listening and helping, helping people learn, helping support your projects in WASM, whatever it is that you want to do. We're very happy to, to do that. It's a, it's a part of the, you know, we're part of the community. Yeah. So yeah, that was all that we had for, for this talk. Thank you very much for attending it. Um, okay. We have a few minutes for questions, I think. Yeah, so I think we have three minutes, so I think we have time for some questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me go back to that slide. Actually, yeah. Yeah, actually it was on the, it was on the a, demo. Yeah. yeah, it was, ah, okay, here we have them. Yeah, so the question is about the different flags that we were using for Docker RAM, what they mean and how they actually connect to, to RAM, um, a WebAssembly model. So the first thing that we have is the runtime, which is basically selecting what's the identifier for the container, the shame that will run this specific application. So when you, when you run um, with, uh, with this, a specific flag, and by default using Docker Desktop, you are not installing only Wasm time, which is the one that I use in the examples, but you are getting, for example, Wasm Edge. And if you install them with KWASM in, in Kubernetes, you will get Wasm time, Wasm Edge, Spin, WWS, and then your application may want to target one specific uh, runtime. So this is the reason of that specific flag, to specify the one that you want to target. Because for Wasm time and Wasm Edge, they are pretty, pretty similar, but for others like application frameworks, there are many differences. So that's the way you, you target it. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's partly, you know, a function of, you know, the ecosystem is experimenting with lots of different things and different, uh, so I, I think in, in future, we would like to make this more automated, work out mm -hmm. which one you need and add metadata into the build so that a lot of the stuff goes away. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, some of this is just kind of temporary things. We should be able to work out. If you put, if you, if you build the container, you shouldn't need the minus minus platform yep. necessarily if, it's, if the container is built with the For. right metadata and things. So, so I think that, you know, some of it's, some of it's temporary, um, temporary line noise, which will hopefully go away. Mm. Yeah, it's platform. Yeah, platform's detectable from the from the image metadata. So. Yep. So I have a little bit more of a philosophical question. Uh, <laughs> so Docker is an incredibly successful project for developers. It has a, a great ecosystem, and WebAssembly is still early on. So do you have any advice for for the companies and the projects that are building this? I mean, one of the things that, you know, made Docker successful was the huge ecosystem built around standards. And I think that um, WebAssembly does come from, this very much comes from 
a community that respects and really values standards. So I think they've kind of learned that lesson that, um, you know, it, the standards kind of if in the Docker ecosystem came out a little bit later and they were kind of driven, they were more standard, standardizing what had been built rather than starting with standards. But um, it's a di you know, kind of different approach. But I think there's, you need standards to make an ecosystem big. I think that, um, you know, you also need, you know, de developer experience that's, that's easy as well. I think that, um, you know, there's still, um, there's still work to do in just terms of making things just work. It's getting way better. Um, and supporting, you know, supporting multiple languages and things is, is way better than it was a few years ago. And it's, we're getting much nearer the just works situation, which I think is also really important because people get really frustrated if yep. they get stuck in things that are just hard to fix and they don't understand because they would just want to, you know, run their application and it doesn't work. So I think there's a, there's still work to do there, but it's way better than it was. And, um, I think we're still, I think we still haven't um, shown people what the, what the compelling value for them as developer of using WASM is. There's a, there's a lot of excitement around it, you know, some of the things about it, but we don't kind of know which things are more important. I think that with containers, it took a long time to work out which were the actually the valuable, the most valuable bits. There was a lot of discussion about, like, for many years about containers versus VMs, and that wasn't the interesting thing about containers was how they compared to VMs. It was what the kind of workflows they enabled, you know, the the, the kind of whole cloud native development, the whole scalability, the repeatability, reproducibility. Those things were the things that actually were valuable in the end. And um, actually things like the, the security boundary of containers was less, you know, there was a lot of, you know, how, how strong was it? Was it as strong as a VM? The answer was no, but it didn't matter. You know, so I think the, the different kind of nuances take a long time to kind of feed into what can I do that's different and amazing? What, what, what is this ecosystem? doing for me. And I think we're still in the learning phase with WebAssembly about which things are going to be important and which things are, are less important and which things people are going to get really excited by. So I think there's still a lot of experimentation and kind of uh, and learning and, and building needed to find those things. Was that philosophical enough answer? <laughs> Well, I think we're, we're holding you away from uh, refreshments, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>